Here's a very basic explanation of how natural selection works. And remember, this is one. Um, and remember, this is one mechanism that can lead to evolution, which is looking at the changes in populations over time and on a larger scale, the changes of species over time. So what you have to have is some heritable variation in the population. And by that, we mean different alleles, which remember, those are just versions of genes, meaning that they have different um, DNA sequences. I should also mention there are situations, a lot of situations actually, where it's not actually the gene. Um, that has a difference. It's a regulatory sequence that has a difference, but in any case, it's the it is still differences in DNA sequences. Okay, so you have heritable variation, which means it's in the DNA, and then you have to have some sort of selective pressure. So if you have no variation, then there's nothing to move to from that initial population, right? If let's say the rock pocket mouse example, if all the mice are light mice and there are no dark mice in the population, then it doesn't matter that the light mice are getting eaten more often on the dark lava rock and reproducing less. There is nothing to move to. So a mutation has to arise that uh, leads to variation. Now, does this arise on demand? No. Um, it may never arise and the population could dwindle and go extinct or the population just could stay the same. Um, but mutations happen all the time, and with a large enough population, the probability of something occurring that results in a different phenotype is high. And this doesn't have to result in a super dark mouse to begin with. The fur just might be a little bit darker. And uh, as long as that is um, slightly more successful at reproduction, then you'd expect a shift in the population towards that phenotype, and thus that genotype, that allele type. So the selective pressure means that not all, um, the selective pressure means some of the organ, the selective pressure just means there's something in the environment that is not um, allowing all the organisms to survive and reproduce the same. So for example, um, the rock pocket mice, the selective pressure there is the predators. Right, so whether you're getting eaten or not, so avoiding being prey. Another example would be um, if there's enough food. So if there's not, then some um, of the uh, organisms might, if there's not enough food, then some individuals may be better at getting food than others. Uh, also, if there's different food types, for example, the finches um, on the Galapagos, their beaks are different shapes. And so some can eat different sorts of food sources. And if you only have one sort of food source on an island, let's say, the finches with the beaks that um, are better at eating that food source, let's say, the nectar from a flower, the beaks that are better at getting down there with the nectar or the pollen, I should say, probably. Let's say the beaks of the ground finches that uh, crack the hard seeds. If uh, you have finches that have beaks that are thicker and better at cracking those hard seeds, and that's what's available during that season, they're going to survive and reproduce more successfully. And we'll see that in a minute. Um, mate availability. So some or individual, some individuals may be better at obtaining mates than others. And remember, this has to do with not just survival, but most importantly, reproduction. Because reproduction is how you pass on those versions of the genes. I'm sure you can think of other examples as well of selective pressures. Um, so we could say something like the weather for a season, or it could be climate overall. So a larger, a longer term shift in um, a longer term shift in the environmental conditions. So that could be a selective pressure. Which ones can survive better? in that either that season or um, 
either that single season or multiple seasons. Um, there are other Another example of the food is uh, the another example of the food is human lactase persistence, meaning that um, the humans can digest milk if their lactase, which is an enzyme, can still break down the lactose when they are adults. And so the idea there is that in groups where uh, lactose was available, as in groups of humans with some sort of animal producing milk, um, they could survive and reproduce better than the individuals in the population that couldn't digest the lactose as adults, which is the wild type normal state. So those mutant versions, which are the lactase persistent or lactose tolerant individuals, would have a better chance of living and reproducing because they had that food source they could actually eat. Okay, so you've got those two conditions, and then what happens is that the combination of those leads to what I'm going to call differential survival, and maybe most importantly, reproductive success. Basically meaning that some organisms in the population some individuals reproduce and survive more successfully than others. And so what that leads to um, the more successful individuals pass on their genes and I should really say that pass on their alleles uh, all the organisms would pass on the genes. It's not like some of them have the genes and some don't. They just have different versions of the genes or different regulatory sequences. But they pass on those alleles more often than the ones that are not surviving and reproducing as successfully. And that is going to result in a shift in the population towards the favorable or we could say better adapted alleles. And so if this happens generation after generation, then you'd expect the population to shift. So we saw in the rock pocket mice that in the condition, and we should say that too, um, and we should also say that this is environmental or condition dependent. As in, on the sandy desert, the, the feature that is going to be more adaptive and more successful is the sandy coats, the light coats. But on the dark lava rock, when that environment arose, then the dark mouse coats are more, um, are more adapted to that environment. So what is well adapted just depends on the conditions or the environment the organism finds itself in. And that's why we also say the variation here, I could also say, remember this variation arises because of mutations. And mutations are just the um, mistakes in DNA replication that result in those different DNA sequences. So, for example, in the original organism, DNA is much longer, but let's say it's an ATC. And then when it gets copied by accident, it's an AAC. And so the AAC can get passed on to the offspring. And... And so the AAC can get passed on to the offspring, and then maybe that leads to a different kind of phenotype. So let's see how that might happen. Okay. So let's see how this might happen.
Okay, so here's our DNA. DNA is double-stranded, so one strand has the A, T, C, and a lot more DNA. That's why I put the lines. But the other strand is going to have the T, A, G. And that is going to be red. This part of the gene is going to be red, and that is going to... And that will be red to make mRNA. One outcome, but that's what we're looking at. So mRNA and that mRNA will have a particular sequence. Let's say it's reading off the bottom sequence in this case. You'll end up with an mRNA that's an AUG based off of this, so it's the complement to that. And then that mRNA will code for a specific amino acid, that particular part of the mRNA. And in this case, that amino acid, that amino acid is isoleucine, ILE is the abbreviation. And isoleucine will be part of a polypeptide. So really, it's going to be lots and lots and lots of amino acids together. And isoleucine is just one of those. And that polypeptide, because of the characters of the amino acid, will fold into a particular structure, and let's say in the end the structure looks like this. And let's just say it's embedded in the cell membrane. And its job is to receive signals and transfer those signals to the cell, and then the cell goes and does something. Okay, so that's the original state, let's say. The mutant DNA we said it's AAC now, so the mutation is here, and the other strand also has that. So this base pair here is the mutant base pair. And let's say that ends up, well, that would code for looking at the bottom strand, your AAC now. And you can see that's different from what we had before. We had AUC, this is AAC for the mRNA. And let's see what amino acid AAC codes for. That's going to be asparagine. That's asparagine. That's the amino acid. And again, Asparagine is part of a long polypeptide with many amino acids. Actually, yep, it would be the same position. Let's say this position number two. And asparagine and actually if you look in your book in um, the chapter about proteins and amino acids, there's a chart that shows you the different characteristics of amino acids. So asparagine is um, polar, and I should mention isoleucine is nonpolar. So let's say that one change, which could be the case, is going to change how the folding happens, and then let's say this one looks like this because of the folding. Okay, so it can't, it, it might not be able to bind in the same way that the um, other protein can. So in this case, maybe the protein can't bind it anymore, and there's no function. So that's going to lead to a different phenotype, which is the physical outcome. Or sometimes maybe it binds more strongly um, to the protein. So maybe instead of not binding at all, it would bind and it would bind more strongly. And so that could lead to a different function uh, maybe more signal, and then you get a different phenotype. So it doesn't have to be no function. That's just one example here. Um, so anyway, you can see that the change in the DNA ends up leading to a change in the protein structure,
which then results in potentially a different phenotype. And if those phenotypes, one is more advantageous for survival and reproduction in the environment, that one's going to be selected for. So then maybe this one with the um, lack of function, let's say that ends up giving you So let's say this one with the lack of function, let's, let's say it doesn't bind anymore, um, ends up giving the organism um, So if the mutation here gives an organism a characteristic that's more advantageous, then you'd expect that to um, persist and increase. So in the end, this is basically one way, one molecular mechanism that you can get natural selection. And remember, the natural selection part is that the different phenotypes are more or less successful in the environment, and that's the natural part because it's nature, environment, conditions dictating which one is selected for or against. And sometimes neither is. Both are equally successful, and so there is no selection. Um, and so uh, you would not expect a shift in the population towards the mutation. You'd expect it to stay uh, the same as how it was. So the more variation in the population, meaning the more meaning more and more versions of the protein, let's, um, that could lead to, um, so the more variation in the population, meaning that there are more types of these shapes of proteins, the more variation in the population, meaning there's more versions of these different uh, protein. That's why we say having a lot of variation in the population is a good thing for evolution purposes, because that's why we say having a lot of genetic variation in the population is advantageous for is advantageous for the ability of that population to evolve because the more versions of this protein you have, the more likely that one of them is going to create a phenotype. The more likely that one of them will result in a phenotype that will be advantageous for that organism in that environment. So let's look at one simple molecular mechanism by which you might get different phenotypes, which would end up having different adaptive, which would end up being differentially adaptive in the environment. So you're going to start with the DNA. Remember that's double-stranded, and not all the DNA is, um, not all the DNA are gene. Not all segments of DNA are genes, but let's say this segment here just is a gene. And a gene just means a part of the DNA that ends up coding for a functional molecule. We'll look at a protein in this case. So in this gene, one part of it has a sequence of ACC. Okay, so that's the DNA sequence. On the other side, it would have that as the complementary sequence of TGG. Okay, so that DNA is then read, and it makes RNA, or the DNA is then read to make RNA, and we'll look at the mRNA that can be made. That gene is read, and mRNA is made using that code. And the mRNA is single-stranded, so let's say it read the bottom strand here, so it read the ACC, and in the mRNA, that's going to end up coding for UGG. And I do it in threes because that's how mRNA is read by the machinery in the cell, and so what that machinery will do is read the mRNA to build a polypeptide, which is just a chain of molecules, little molecules we call amino acids. I'll do AA, but that's amino acid there. And in this case, we'll say that the amino acid 
The amino acid coded for by UGG is an amino acid. The amino acid coded for by UGG is tryptophan. Okay, and tryptophan is just one amino acid in this long polypeptide, which is tons and tons of amino acids, so it would be like this, and then that polypeptide then folds into a particular shape. Tryptophan is nonpolar, has lots of carbon-hydrogen bonds, so it's a nonpolar amino acid, this guy here, and so it's going to fold into a particular shape, and that's particular, and now it's, uh, we call it a protein. And let's just draw that schematically. Let's say our protein looks like this, and it's in the cell membrane, and its job, what it can do, is to bind molecules in the environment. Okay, and then it's going to send some signal to the cell, and then the cell is going to do some sort of function. And that function is going to give that organism a certain type of phenotype, we'll say phenotype 1. So for example, maybe this is a light coat in the mice. Right, so there's our initial situation. Now we're going to look at a mutation. So we'll have the DNA again. And in this case, mutation, we're going to say, is just in the gene. And so it just means a change when DNA was being copied. There was a mistake in that DNA copying. And so instead of the ACC here, Let's say we have, have a GC instead of ACC. On the other side, it would be TCG. And so our mutation, this is right here. It's the mutation or mutant base pair. And so that's going to be read into mRNA. This time, the code ends up giving you UCG instead of UGG, and that results in the amino acid as part of a polypeptide, again, same position, but instead of tryptophan, this time it's an amino acid called serine. Serine is a polar amino acid. It has um, hydroxyl groups, OH bonds, which are polar. That could make the protein fold in a different way. Doesn't necessarily, but if it does, then that will schematically represent it like this. Could end up having a protein in the membrane again. It's grossly enlarged. It wouldn't actually look like that, but. Uh, let's say that protein it has a different shape, and so it, um, let's say it just can't bind the molecule anymore because it doesn't fit properly, okay? And so what that would mean is that you'd have you may have a different function, so now the signal doesn't get into the cell, and so then the cell doesn't do whatever function that is, and let's say you have phenotype 2, and let's say that makes a dark coat. So in this example, let's say the binding of the protein here uh, ends up shutting down melanin production to produce a light coat, so when it doesn't bind, then you have a situation where it doesn't decrease melanin production, so you have a dark coat. Um, that's not necessarily how it works in the rock pocket mice, but this is just an example. Anyway, so you end up with two different phenotypes.
Okay, so you end up with two different phenotypes here. Uh, in our example, a light coat and a dark coat, and then perhaps um, in the environment of a lava rock, which is dark, this mutation version would survive and reproduce more often. So then you'd see the shift in the population towards this DNA sequence um, instead of this DNA sequence, which it started as. So molecularly, that's a very simple example of how you could get a change in phenotype due to a mutation, which is the change in genotype or the gene sequence, and how that might lead to a natural selection situation. Just note that there are other cases where the DNA sequence change is in a regulatory region, and so it can make more and more and more protein be expressed or less protein be expressed, or maybe it's expressed at a different time during the um, development of the organism, let's say. And so that is a really common way also that you get different phenotypes is by changing how much and when the gene is turned off and on. In this case, we're actually changing the protein shape itself. And sometimes your mutation would actually result in no protein being formed. And so that could give you another result as well. And this is 